we will look at uh, the UDOT I-80 feasibility study. Presenting on that is uh, Becky Nix from UDOT. All right, and I apologize, Cody Parker wasn't able to be here, so you guys are stuck with me for the whole time on this. And I'll try and cover his information throughout it. Um, the I-80 corridor feasibility study was kind of a new approach for us to look at an entire holistic um, corridor bridges. So we looked at 36 different bridges, tested the heck out of it to try and get some validation of different testing that was available and what we wanted to do with it. And just kind of a new process for it, uh, for UDOT that I'm pretty excited about. So initially we started looking at NDE as ways to better look at our bridge decks. Visual inspection, especially on freeways where we can't get out, we can't close lanes, we can't fully sound everything out um, has been quite a bit of a challenge as we're looking at trying to identify what the actual bridge needs are before we get out to construction and find out, well, this shouldn't have been pothole patching, this should have been a full deck replacement. So we're trying to get out ahead of the projects and get a little better identification of what those projects are and what the actual needs are. Um, hopefully we're getting out there doing it a little bit quicker than uh, visual inspections by using NDE. Um, Utah is one of those states that we don't close a lane unless we absolutely have to. So it, we're very conscientious of what lanes we close, when we close it. So it's pretty hard for us to get, you know, daytimes on weekdays to close anything down. So we want to try and reduce the amount of time we have lanes down, really reduce the impacts that we have out there, um, and just make sure that we're making the best decisions as well. So... We want to make sure as we go into projects as well that we know how much needs to be repaired. We're appropriately funding projects for that so we don't have massive overruns or underruns on our pothole patching and other quantities. And really just kind of identify what we need for each of the bridges holistically and how that fits into a larger master plan. So as I said, we picked an entire corridor. This kind of came about because we started out scoping a project in this corridor. We've got 36 bridges on Interstate 80 and Bangor Highway, which goes into the Salt Lake International Airport, which has just had a full overhaul. So we want to make sure that we've got good access into there. We don't have pothole bridge decks. It's a main freight corridor as well. So this is a pretty impactful area, really heavy truck traffic. We started out looking at it thinking, okay, we've got a lot of asphalt overlays. We can go out, we can patch the bridge decks and have an applicable project. And then as we looked into it more, we started looking at, well, maybe we need to go to hydro demo or maybe we need to go to deck replacements. And we went about four rounds of rescoping this project as the funding got closer and we realized we just didn't have a good understanding of what was going on, especially the bridges that had asphalt on them. And a handful of them also have stay-in-place metal deck forms underneath. So we had no good idea from visual inspections, really, of what those decks were doing. Um, so we started out with a two-phase um, approach to this project. The first was to really go out and look at what information was out there, what testing methods were out there, and what was available to us so that we weren't recreating the wheel, identify a testing plan, and then we did a contract mod to go into a phase two where we implemented the testing plan and then went into developing a feasibility study and a corridor asset management plan, looking at all 36 bridges, what the actual needs were, which were the highest priorities to get out and do work on, and looking at kind of a 20-year funding horizon of how each of those projects would fit into our overall program. Because this is a pretty small section of our inventory and so we can't be dedicating years and years of our total funding. So we had to really kind of spread that out over the 20 year time frame. And um, as we got into the projects, we leveraged a lot of national resources that were out there, um, looking at AASHTO TSP2 website, what um, previous presentations had been done about different NDE methods using SCHRP, FHWA websites, different conference proceedings, and really trying to gather as much information out there as to what would be applicable for these bridge decks and holistically for the entire bridges. So based on those funding or findings and what the types of bridges were, what the overlay types were currently on the bridges, whether they were concrete or steel structures, we developed an overall asset or testing plan for it using automated acoustic sounding um, GPR 
both cart-based and truck-mounted, high-resolution imagery, infrared, and then going a little beyond non-destructive testing, we also did a lot of chloride testing throughout the corridor as well. Um, paint testing throughout, and um, yeah, so this is a little easier to read of what the different testing methods were. It took us about a month to do all of the filled data and all of the collection, and then it was about five and a half months to process all of that. One of the major pieces of it was we took so many bridge deck cores throughout that it took a long time to get those through the lab. So that's kind of one of our lessons learned is making sure we have the resources going forward to be able to process all of the testing that we've gathered in a timely fashion and kind of move these through a little bit quicker. Um, so high resolution imagery, we did truck mounted. We also did some UAS mounted um, during the first phase of the project. So we only did the truck mounted high resolution imagery on 11 of the bridges because the other ones we were able to get that from the UAS images. Um, this kind of gives us a baseline map. We can visually see where we've got previous patches, where we're seeing open potholes, where we're seeing visual defects, and it also gives us an opportunity to be able to overlay the other testing methods that we've used. Um, we used um, BDI Soundar technology on 18 of the bridges. We didn't do this on any of the bridges with asphalt overlays just because it's not really effective when you have an asphalt overlay. So we just did it on ones we had bare decks or thin bonded polymer overlays. Um, this was done at fairly rapid speed. I think it's about five to 10 miles an hour that you can go over the bridge deck, so you don't necessarily need full closures. We did it with rolling closures uh, with highway patrol escorting. Um, ground penetrating radar was on the same truck. We did the truck mounted ground penetrating radar for the decks themselves looking for the defects, but then we also did um, the cart based um, GPR for our approach labs to identify any areas that we had voids underneath, we had settlement or anything else where we maybe need to go in and do some approach lab jacking, deep soil stabilization, or potentially do approach lab replacements if we've lost um, the bearing of the approach slabs on the abutments. Um, we did two types of infrared. One was the truck mounted, and then we also did ultra time domain infrared. Unfortunately, it was a very high fire season for us, and it was so smoky in the area that we were not able to get any good um, infrared data off of the static infrared. That's something going into it that was a big lesson learned for us is we had to look at some of those environmental conditions that could have an impact on it that maybe we weren't readily aware of going into it. Um, with the um, ultra time domain infrared, that's basically you're putting a camera out there and measuring several cycles of you know, day to night temperature changes and fluctuations in an attempt to get um, more cycles and a little bit better information because you're not wait, hoping for that one static time where you're getting big temperature swings throughout the day. And um, we did that both on the underside of some of the bridge decks as well as the top side on a handful of them. So um, based on this, we looked at each individual bridge, what the testing was coming back as, and started to look at how we could package the projects and where it made sense to bundle them into projects together, um, bundling on proximity, what closures we could kind of piggyback on and not have lots of different closures in the same area that don't correspond to each other, looking at what the previous treatments were on the bridges and which ones were the most critical ones to start grouping together. Um, and then um, from there we started identifying what each of the treatments were for each of the bridges um, and started to put them into project packages. In 2022 dollars, that came out to about $181 million, and our annual budget is $88 million for preservation, rehab, maintenance, replacements. So we knew we couldn't do all of this at once, and we had to really stagger it out. Um, so from there, we started looking at, because this is such a small portion, looking at 25 to 30 million every three to five years in that corridor so that it wasn't taking all of our funding in such a short 
um, section of our inventory. So this did give us a lot of really good information about what's out there for NDE. It gave us, we felt like a much better plan for how to move forward with this essential corridor. Um, it gave us a lot of really good documentation and hopefully this also gives us a chance to be able to validate the technologies that we used so that we know what we want to move forward with in the future. Um, like I said, we really need to look at what those environmental factors are in the future and try and time those a little bit better when we're doing the testing. Um, we probably do not need to do this high of a level of testing ever again. This was more kind of a pilot for us to get a level of understanding and a good idea of what we want to be doing when we need to do NDE and go beyond visual inspections. And the other thing is, is at the end of this, we had a 600 page report. So as we start into our first project and they're asking, okay, well, where's the feasibility study? I don't know if you guys really want that. That's a whole lot of reading and you're not gonna wanna go through it. So something going coming out of that is in addition to the full feasibility study, we want to have separate reports of individual project packages so that can roll right into a design team and they can move forward with projects without having to dig through 300 pages of what different testing is out there na nationwide. Um, so from this, this also really leveraged us in a good spot for um, the BIP grants that started to come out. Um, we did submit one for the bridge project grants that we're really hopeful of. Um, we'll see if we get funding for that. And then we also did get a planning grant to go ahead and move forward with um, selecting another corridor that we can take the lessons from this and apply it to another corridor that we can then have multiple asset management plans that we can pick projects off of each as we move forward with each of our funding cycles. Um, and we've also used some of the technologies already on other corridors as we're going out and trying to get some of these rapid assessments done that we can't close lanes to get out there to develop projects on. So from there, we are now going into our first project, and I'm really excited about this one because we identified a lot of projects that we needed hydro demo and full bridge replacements and just high dollar projects, but we have a lot of these overlays that were already failing, and we couldn't wait for those funding cycles to catch up and get us into some of those $20, $30 million projects. So our first project is to go through and um, do some preservation up front to get us by until we get to those initial major projects. So we're preserving 18 of the bridges throughout the project, and that includes going through and taking the asphalt overlays off of a high percentage of these bridges, which is gonna give us the chance to go out manually sound, do the repairs and validate, were we getting better information from infrared? Were we getting better information from GPR? And be able to correlate back, this is a percentages of defects that we were picking up from each technology, and this is what we actually had to go out and patch. So that's gonna give us a really good idea of maybe what we want to do moving forward um, with the different NDE methods that are out there and what we want to do on our other projects. Um, like I said, this is right by the Salt Lake International Airport. So this is a pretty heavily <laughs> traveled area. Um, so going forward, and these are Cody's slides, so I'm trying to <laughs> pick up exactly what his intent was. But with this, don't expect any to be anybody to be able to actually read what's on this slide, but just to show kind of a level of effort that's going into this project. So we have a lot of different bid items on this that are coming out of it. And like I said, 18 bridges that are part of this project. For the project, um, we're gonna be doing a lot of asphalt surfacing removal and Part of what I'm gonna go through is differences that we had between what was recommended in the feasibility study and what's actually going into this project. So our region pavement engineers asked us to try out a highly modified hot mix asphalt in this corridor that is supposed to be a lot higher polymer content that would then, in theory, be a waterproof asphalt. Um, 
So most of those will get a waterproofing membrane as well, but one of them we're going back to kind of test, and I'll go into that a little bit more and see how waterproof it really is. Um, we are replacing some thin bonded polymer overlays as part of the project, um, and some of them we are just doing a penetrating sealer. We have a couple bridges that we're doing approach slab replacements because in addition to settlement at the roadway end, we've lost the back wall underneath some of them and they've dropped, so we need to do full replacements of those. Um, and then just tying into the roadway sections as we're replacing those approach slabs, some of those items. Um, I've heard a lot of talk lately about concrete pavements walking up on the bridge approaches. Um, all of the pavement joints eventually get filled up with minor debris and the pavements will grow right up to our bridges. We've got a joint there, closes up our joint and blows up the ends of our approach slabs. So part of this is we're going back and reestablishing a lot of those joints and resealing a lot of those joints to hopefully protect them from additional damage. Um, with our, one of the items that was added after the feasibility study is when we have a continuous asphalt overlay that then goes over an asphalt section, we've started doing a relief joint where we just saw cut through two thirds of the asphalt to give us kind of a controlled crack because we know we're gonna get some movement there. And we've had a lot of success with going in and um, doing that really quick, easy saw cut and we're seeing just dividends in what our returns are on that. Um, also with the pothole patching, most of these bridges within the next five to 10 years are going to be getting a full hydro demo or a deck replacement on it. So we didn't want to spend tons of additional funds on just preservation of this corridor. We're trying to get by. So, and because we're not 100% sure what the pothole patching needs are in this area, we've established we will patch if we go out and sound and our open patches and delaminations are less than 20%, we will patch all of that. But if it exceeds the 20%, then we're going to only be patching the open potholes and putting that overlay back over the top just to try and get it through to the project. One thing that we've implemented with our pothole patching specification is an as-built worksheet that we have our contractors fill out where they identify not only the quantities of pothole patching they're doing, but the locations on the bridges, which is really critical to us if we've got asphalt overlays on. Because if we start seeing defects in those overlays, we can identify whether that's somewhere we've previously patched and identify if it's maybe a patch failing underneath the asphalt overlay or if it's a new area that we haven't addressed before. Um, and it also gives us a really good idea of how bad the decks are and allows us to get more um, information on what that holistic asset management approach needs to be for those bridge decks and how soon we need to be looking at the hydro demo or the deck replacements to get out and do those. So that portion was added that's a little bit different than typical. Um, the feasibility study did call for concrete coatings, uh, so a penetrating siller of the abutments and wing walls. This was taken out of the project just because we're trying to stretch our pennies as far as we possibly can. And also, most of these abutments and wing walls are in areas where we have integral abutments. We don't have open joints over them. So we felt like it was kind of a limited benefit. We did add parapet sealing to all of the um, bridges. Initially, ones that we thought the deck replacements were gonna be coming fairly soon, we didn't have the parapet ceiling as part of that, but we did add it in because we understand it's probably five years before a lot of these are gonna be done. Um, we had a couple bridges that were looking at attempting to replace the glands in strip seal or modular joints. We haven't had a lot of success with that in the past, um, just because the headers get corroded and degraded and we have a hard time getting those new seals back in. We're gonna attempt it on this project and hopefully we're successful on it. Um, we did have a couple of our bridges that the elastomeric bearing pads have walked out, so we're gonna to try to reset those as well. So on the highly modified hot mix asphalt, it's a five to 7% polymer, three and a half percent void, and they're saying a 15 year life, hopefully for those overlays, typically we're seeing about 10 to 12 years with our standard asphalt. And it's fairly close in cost to what we're seeing with our standard HMA. So we felt like 
this was a really good corridor for us to test it out on because we know future work is coming. So if it doesn't work out well, we're not stuck with something that will be problematic for us to babysit and take care of. Um, it's about 10 to $12 more per ton than our standard HMA. So it's not a significant cost change to the project. Um, as part of that, we do have one bridge that We've got sister structures carrying different directions. One of them we're going to put a waterproofing membrane underneath the asphalt and one we're not to kind of try and watch that performance and see whether or not we're comfortable going forward with not putting waterproofing membranes under it. Typically, this is not something we would try, especially not on interstate. That's a lot of risk, but where we know those other projects are coming, we felt like this was a really good chance for us to do that side-by-side -side comparison. Um, as part of that, because we're not putting the waterproofing membrane, we are sealing that joint between the parapet and the top of the asphalt overlay just to make sure we're not getting water going into that joint and um, causing issues. So we're doing one side of it where we're doing a full um, polymer treatment that extends across a portion of the asphalt and then up the face of the parapet and then we're doing one where we're doing just a hot pour joint sealant to see if one is more effective than the other. On this, the other thing that we're going to do is prior to placing the asphalt, we're going to drill a couple holes in the decks themselves. Once again, this is a great test case because we know they're going to be replaced soon and so we don't feel as bad doing a little bit of this testing on it. But we're hoping that by doing that, we can see if we've got water actively coming through the deck, and then we can start monitoring and seeing how waterproof that HMA is on those decks. Um, so this is what I was talking about with some of those approach slabs that the back wall has crumbled. We used to do a six inch seat for the approach slabs to sit on, and we're seeing a lot of failures of those about 25 to 30 years into the deck's life or into the bridge's life. So we're seeing about a two inch drop on a lot of these, which is pretty significant of an impact on your ride, especially we like to drive fast in Utah. So our speed limit along this corridor is 70 miles an hour and you hit a two inch bump at 70, you fill it. So we're going to go in, replace the approach slabs, take out that section of um, the abutment where the approach slab is sitting and lengthen out that seat and basically add a corbel on the back of it so it's got a little more bearing area and hopefully we won't see these issues again in the future. Um, so once again, just quick overview of what that area is and open it up for questions. Hey, that was awesome presentation, Becky. Um, that's almost like 35 mini bridge asset management plans for yep. those bridges, mm -hmm. pretty much. Uh, we've done something similar on signature bridges, but so that's pretty good information. Our, and, and you use AshtoWare, right? We do. And so are you planning or have you already maybe put all that information for those specific bridges into AshtoWare yet? Or that really, in my opinion, would mm -hmm. refine your models. Right now we haven't. I think as we start funding the projects, then that will go into our work candidates to start working into our optimizer and identifying those as funded projects. But where a lot of them are 10 to 15 years out, we haven't put those ones in yet. So. And with that feasibility study, um, that, that was like one big project. Did you do that in house or was that like a two to $3 million engineering services or? Um, I think it came in at about 2 million, uh, one and a half to 2 million. And we um, did consult out on that. We don't have the resources to be able to do all the testing and all of that. We've got a pretty small bridge group in Utah. That's so. pretty impressive information for those bridges. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yep. Becky, over here to the right. Okay. Um, the two parallel structures that have the, the uh, asphalt wearing surface with the different waterproofing membrane or lack of, mm -hmm. other than the holes in the deck, are you anticipating any other ways to observe those structures or any non-destructive testing or anything in the short period of time? Or is it mostly, okay, let's wait until we get to the next rehab when we, when we tear this asphalt off and see what it looks like? That's pretty much going to be, um, it's going to be pretty limited just because we don't have the resources to go out and keep retesting these. So it's going to be watching through those drain holes and then 
hopefully we can coordinate with our contractor when we do the deck replacements and we can get out and at least get a visual on those decks after we get the asphalt off. And the thought process on the, on the treatment between the barrier and the asphalt on the non-waterproofed, mm -hmm. do you anticipate either of those performing differently or is it just, hey, let's give it a shot and see if they do? I think the wider polymer strip is probably gonna do a lot better um, we don't get great bond with the hot pour, and if it's not really clean and applied well, I think a lot of times that ends up peeling off, especially if it's three, four years before we do the deck replacement. So I would anticipate the Palmer one um, performing a little bit better. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Becky, the detail that you showed on the back wall, you know, where this approach slab sits on the back wall, mm -hmm. Do you guys have a dowel going from back wall to the approach slab or not? Um, we do not. Thank you, Becky, and I know you're going to stay up there, so. <laughs> the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.